when those uh, performances were happening, I knew when it came to the crucifixion, it was like it was like a supercharged thing. It was very, very strange. Something was going on. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm good, Russell. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm very good, thank you. On the last day of autumn, apparently, it's uh, it's uh, no, it's the last day of summer. What am I talking about? It's the last day of summer today. The last day of summer. Birthday yeah, we're going to... tomorrow. But um, it's, it's it's sunny in London. It's getting cut. It's grey and cloudy in Swansea, which is kind of the default mode. At least there's no rain. I'll <laughs> send you some good sun vibes later on. Thank you, man. Thank you. Um, so this is your second time on the channel, which is just yeah. brilliant. Um, thank you so much for giving up your time twice. Now. Uh, before you were here with the Grand Ambition team, which I'm sure you'll touch on in a moment. Um, and now in a moment, we're going to talk about um, a production you were involved in in 1996, which is not 25 years ago at all. Um, it's only yesterday, <laughs> um, where you played Jesus in Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, so, but before we talk about the past, let's talk about the present. What are you working on right now? Is there any sort of new plans, new music? What's yeah, I've got some. I've got some new music that I'm working on. Some solo stuff. I'm with uh, two amazing singer songwriters called Andy Collins and Pete Riley. We've got a little writing thing together, and uh, and my days are taken up as part of a creative collective called Grand Ambition, based at the Grand Theatre in Swansea, mm. headed up by a, a great actor and a writer called Richard Milan. And then Michelle McTurnan and Christian Patson and myself. And basically, during the lockdown, Rich approached me and said, I'm moving back to Swansea. I'd love to bring some of the creatives together and see what we can create, and see if we can put some theatre back in the Grand Theatre or back in, back in Swansea, really. And then we approached the council and they were really uh, open to our idea and offered us a, an office at the Grand Theatre. So we're... we're in the process of getting some new material together, Rich has written a play. Uh, we're working with the National Theatre of Wales next year. They're coming down to do a, a really exciting project. And it, this is all new for me, Russell. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll gladly write you a song and sing it to you. But this whole world of negotiating things that I never thought I would, you, mm -hmm. you know, things to do with governance and best, you know, best practice and all of these new terms that my my very you know uh, full brain is having trouble to contain. <laughs> yeah. I must be honest but it's amazingly interesting stuff and being yeah. in the theater every day is is inspiring and the grand theaters you know plays played such a big part in my life growing up um, yeah, yeah it, it's it's just amazing new kind of chapter really yeah, and it's nice. It's also as you get older. I tell myself this all the time: is like keep learning new stuff, putting yeah. yourself in slightly dangerous spaces. Is a yeah. it's, it's a healthy approach in the arts, that's for sure. You've got to keep on Absolutely. your game. I, I think. Absolutely. Um, so let's talk about uh, Jesus Christ Superstar now. Um, I think it's safe to say because I, I saw the production as well that in 1996, <laughs> this production kind of how can I put it, kind of blew the wheels off the cart of actually Jesus Christ Superstar, the musical, I think. I think it kind of brought in something that hadn't been seen before in terms of, you know, the context of making that musical, putting it on stage. Um, I know there'd been a Paul Nicholas production, which I was too young to kind of know. And I'd seen the weird, wacky film, which I recommend everybody to watch on a Sunday. Yeah, man. If you've had a glass of wine. Um, Absolutely. It's brilliant. Um, oh. and then there was a period, I think, from, you know, what we've spoken about, that there was a period where Angela Weber and Tim Rice didn't quite have a handle on how it was presented or produced because of legal reasons, et cetera, et cetera. And people can do their own searches on that. And then along came this production at the Lyceum Theatre. And I was kind of post-college, post-university, and I came across the recording and I was like, this feels like the way the production should be. And then I saw it and I thought, it was like watching an oil painting, actually. That's the only way I could best describe when I come out. It was like, literally, it was like watching an oil painting being put on stage. And somehow it solved this idea of putting something so mythical and a rock opera shouldn't work but it worked brilliantly yeah. 
So yeah, how what what's your memories of that that period of you know during that production? Well, Lucas, uh, uh, Luke, oh my God, my brain is. <laughs> let me okay. let me go back. Wow, Russell, <laughs> <laughs> that is it's a big question, man. Listen, I was twenty five. I hadn't gone to college like yourself, or in fact, every other actor in the show. I'd um, I come from a, a rock and roll background. I come from bands, and you know, we used to cover Deep Purple songs and. Ian Gillen was um, the original uh, singer on, on the concept album of Superstar. So I, I knew I had it in my voice, right? I knew I could sing the high notes and do the screamy histrionic stuff. Uh, I previously got into a touring production of Les Mis, basically to impress a girlfriend at the time. And <laughs> that wasn't for me. So an actor called Jonathan Greater X from that production of uh, Les Mis, a few years down the line, had called me and said, they're auditioning for, or they're looking for a Jesus in Superstar. Can you still sing that Gethsemane song? And it was interesting because my brother had called me that morning and said, I just seen Angela Weber on the telly and he was looking for a Jesus. Why didn't you go for it? So I love those synchronicities. Mm. And my whole life has basically been me watching other synchronicities. Anyway, a very long story short, I'd Jonathan Greater X called me and said, come to my house and just sing Gethsemane, you know, a cappella for me. So I went to his place. He was living in Guildford at the time. I sang it for him and he, he, he had a little tear in his eye and he was like, okay, this is good. So he called David Grinrod, who was the casting director for Superstar and is still a casting director in the West End. Lovely man and said, if you see Steve, you're gonna cast him, which was big talk because I, I'd done nothing really. I covered Marius in Les Mis a few years before and you know, was back writing songs for my, for my band and trying to get a record deal. So next thing I was in a room with David Grinrod and singing Gethsemane and he started to cry. And that began my, um, over a year long, 14 audition or so uh, process, which was a whole learn. It felt like uh, going to college in itself. You know, Gail Edwards, the, the brilliant director uh, of, of our version of Superstar. Every time I go for an audition, in fact, she told me later when, when I got the part, she said, when you walked in, because I, you know, I like wearing white shirts. And at the time I had long hair and looked like the <laughs> Western archetypal yeah. Jesus. Right? So she said, when I walked in the door, she was saying, she said to the person next to her, I hope this kid can sing. And then I, I sparked up the, the high notes and she was like, okay. So then, then she felt that she could, you know, I was totally unknown, untrained. Mm. I was just this kind of rough kind of diamond that walked in the door, like some sort of weird, flipping cowboy and then started singing this song that she liked and it kind of fitted they wanted a, a, a relatively unknown cast to re to relaunch this this yeah. uh, version mm -hmm. so every time I went to an audition she'd give me a bunch of stuff to go away and, and look at and think about and learn and you know I, I've got half a brain so I, I took it all on board and mm -hmm. and went and researched and read everything I could listen to every production and basically went back and stole it, you know it was pre-internet this so mm. i'd be calling friends who were in theater who had video recordings of michael crawford was a was a big um uh i i i saw michael crawford on a, a royal variety performance and it inspired me so much because mm. he he didn't have the kind of histrionic stuff, but he had this kind of stillness and this beauty. So I basically stole from him, mm. from Ted Neely and from Ian Gillen and, uh, and, and just kind of kept going back to, to the auditions and doing what Gail said, you know, and, um, yeah. and as it, as it went along, I thought, God, I'm getting closer. I'm getting closer to this. And they bring in people. There were some pop stars they were bringing in, and I remember there were, you know, stuff in the paper at the time. 
Mm. Um, Tony Hadley was up for it. In fact, he was at one of the auditions, the singer with Spando Ballet, and I think Marty Pello was up for it. And, you know, all these kind of big names and who were great singers. And uh, it kept getting closer and closer and closer. And one of the auditions, we had to do this movement thing, and I, I got three left feet. I just, I just can't <laughs> move. In fact, when I got the gig, Gail sent me to Pineapple to learn how to dance, which is a, a whole other story I'll talk about after, which was terrifying. The whole process, actually, Russell, was terrifying. Right. It was terrifying. Yeah, fair um, But the naivety of youth as well was a massive bonus and, um, because I, was, I had nothing to lose and, you know, everything to, to gain from this experience. Mm. And as it got closer and closer and closer, I was thinking, geez, this, I could pull this off. Mm. So I was gaining in confidence and going back and, and giving Gay what she wanted. And, and then they brought in uh, Mike Dixon, the brilliant, um, he was supervising the show. And um, I had, a, I had a couple of sessions with him and he was like, this sounds good. And, you know, I was getting closer. And then for the final audition, they brought in Zubin Vala. Now I had about 14 auditions and it was Zubin Vala, who was playing Romeo for the RSC at the time. Right. So I and I was told this was like oh he's 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 down he's down at the national club and I was like that mm -hmm. I had never been there you know so I was like I didn't even know I I I don't know this language or I didn't know what was going on so they brought Zubin in <laughs> for the audition and everybody that was there all the money people all the you know uh, Tim Rice was there Andrew was there and just everyone was there and we did the confrontation scene which is the mm -hmm. um, the fight just before it goes into Gethsemane and uh, and it's a great scene anyway and Zubin sparked up and he sounded just incredible I thought god this you know he looked incredible he moved incredible he was obviously a brilliant actor you know that and when that was saying but he could sing at chops for miles and I was like bloody hell so during the process he put his hands on me and grabbed me like that and being a boy from Swansea you know that's that's dangerous territory so i kind of grabbed him by the neck and i was like you know and it, and it all went off and afterwards he was like oh mate that was great i was like jesus dude you put your hands on me back home you were lucky not to get sparked out so and, and at that point i knew that we'd had the gig and i said to him we've got this gig man and he said how do you know i said i just and late later on that afternoon i was told right. we had the gig so that was the beginning yeah. So even up to that point, it was a whole, you know, story yeah. and, a, and a, a journey to be yeah. uh, <laughs> so, but it was, it was crazy. It was crazy. It's, it's like you say, the, the innocence of youth, isn't it? It's that. It's like, just, just, just keep doing, just keep doing, just keep doing, just keep doing. Don't question, don't question, just keep doing, which is uh, yeah. something that I sometimes miss, but I try to keep alive if I can. But it's really key, isn't it? I think. And I remember one thing as well, Russell, that um, Gail said to me. After, later on during the, during the rehearsal process, which we'll talk about, um, she said, you've got this aloofness. And I, and I was kind of offended. I was like, so I went away and I, I looked what aloof meant. And I kind of knew what it meant, but I looked it up and I was like, and, and I think that aloofness came from mm. the kind of terror that I was <laughs> daily, daily under. Because we had some serious players. We had Nick Holder who'd done tons of stuff and... Um, David Burt, who, you know, he'd mm. been in the original Les Mis, and we had some real cats there, and mm. Zubin was at the RSC, and what was interesting as well was one of the people at um, Weber's office, when I was, when I got the gig, she said, hey, do you want to come and see Zubin play? And I was like, yeah, I bet I had, right? See what I'm up against here. And 10 minutes into Romeo and Juliet, I, I I had a mini nervous breakdown. I thought, I, I didn't even know what he was, I couldn't even understand what the guy was doing. It was so good. And I was like, I'm in big trouble. So after the after the show, I went backstage and he said, what do you think, mate? I was like, oh God, dude, that was that was absolutely staggering. And, and now I'm terrified. He was like, oh, I'll be all right, I'll be all right. You'll be all right. So I said, you're gonna have to help me, you know? And fair play, and, and this one of the biggest lessons I took from it all. He, when I was way, we met a few times before the rehearsal. And we talked through some stuff, and 
he he gave me loads of help, man. He gave me loads of help. Yeah. And and I've not met a nicer, more talented dude who was only about the, the work, the art of it, and and doing doing the stuff. Yeah. Because I ended up winning an award, um, uh, for best newcomer for um. I used to say it was the best Jesus looking like in London, but I won this award. And when I went back, it was like a lunchtime thing. And I'd gone back to the theater and carry in this award. And the first person I met at the door was Zubin. And he was genuinely like, you deserve it, dude. You've worked so hard. And I was like, wow. I was like, it was so hum. It was very, very humbling. Mm. Yeah. So yeah. So it was, a, it was just, it was a huge learning time. Yeah. So for, for many, many, um, yeah, on many levels, you know. I'm surprised. If we get time on the interview, I'll tell you my Zubin Vala story. Oh, please. Uh, so, 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 talking about the actor, you know, in you now, I can't even imagine the pressure that was on you to play this role inside that production, and you crucified every single night. And that production is, you know, which was beautiful, directly uh, directed by Gail Edwards. It was, I think, the designer was John the Napier, wasn't it? I think John Napier. Was and um, it, you know, how do you handle that? Because that was a whirlwind of stuff. Never mind the show, the part, the crucifixion, but then you've also got the press, the publicity, looking after your voice. Mm -hmm. How the hell did you manage all that? It, it was tough, man. Looking back again, naivety was a was a huge bonus and and helped immensely because I just went with it. The, John Jonathan, who, who then became my agent and ex actor, you know, he we had we would just we just laughed the whole way through because it was you know I was getting up to go on this morning and do all these TV shows and luckily touch wood my voice was in great shape and it just happened to be a voice that was quite durable and I, I didn't drink for a year, I didn't smoke for a year. I took it very, very seriously, you know, because you have to be when you're doing, it was eight shows a week that there was no kind of alternate. Um, so I kept in good shape, I kept fit. The show itself, you know, was, was grueling physically, but kept myself in good shape, drank tons of water, you know, all the good stuff, warmed up, warmed down, mm. all the kind of, and, Mary Hammond, I was sent to see Mary Hammond, the, the great kind of legendary West End uh, vocal coach. And we worked through some stuff and because I'd never had singing lessons up to that point, it was all very natural. So I made sure, she made sure I was doing things right. And I did, and you know, I'm, I'm a bit on the spectrum like that. I'll, I'll really mm. take care of myself. So that was that. All the other stuff, man, I was just winging it. So back then there was no, Later on, when I got signed to Sony Records, we had a person come in to do media training. Back then, it, it wasn't. And when I've looked back at some of the interviews, because before prior to this interview today, I went back and listened to some stuff and re-listened to the album last night, which was mm. glorious. Because I, oh. I think I've probably listened to it twice since, oh, but God. it was glorious to listen to it. And um, I watched some interviews on TV. Oh my God! <laughs> it was utter. I, and, and I get why Gail said I was aloof. I was like this kind of stoner dude, not that I smoke at all, but I was like this stoner dude from Wales who just kind of happened into this into this gig, which was kind of half true, you know? I kind of happened into it. But there was no media training. I was just sent on TV. And, you know, with it was cra it's crazy looking back. It would never happen now. Mm. I don't think somebody you know, who'd had no training in th in theatre unless I'd gone on some sort of reality reality TV show. And this was pre-reality TV show but stuff, by the way. I don't think it would happen these days in this way. They mm. certainly wouldn't allow somebody on TV without any kind of media training. Mm. But it was all just, I winged a lot, man. Or mm. Johnny and myself mm. winged a lot. And Simon Lee, the amazing conductor, who was our conductor, uh, Mike... Dixon supervised it, but Simon was the conductor of the show. We we would get up at you know stupid o'clock and go and do some TV shows. I think we did like thirty in the end or so um, promo things. So we just had a great laugh. So it was just very organic and very. It was a very simple thing, you mm. know. 
Did um, and then when when you were actually in the production again talking about the crucifixion thing, and I remember they didn't hold back. They didn't hold back no. what we were watching. How did you contain yourself during the two, two, two and a half hours, etc.? You know, is there a kind of like a meditative state you have to get into to handle something like that role? Did it affect you when it come off? You know, how was the actual, you know, micromanagement of just you by yourself? Did you see any spot any changes now, 25 years later? Or technique? yeah, loads, loads. I'll get into that in a sec. I just want have to say how great Gail Edwards was as a director for me personally absolutely incredible with me you know because I'd done nothing before and she was very gentle and just kind of molded me into what she wanted really so and what I did and I found these last night as well when I was doing a little bit of research for this uh, for this chat was I I, I had one of those old kind of recorders um, and I, I, I recorded everything Everything she said, I recorded, and I got like 50 tapes that I still have of all of the process. Wow. And um, and I used to go back and listen to it. And over the years, I've gone back and listened to it a few times because she came up with some incredible philosophical deep stuff, man, that was, that was you know, of course, related to the show, but I had, had, you know, resonance in, in a much wider context. So huge respect to her and for all the help. And and because, you know, I, I was literally, this guy walk, literally walked off the street. Mm. But uh, to answer your question, I think the, looking back now, I, I used to kind of meditate before the show and I used to do, because um, I was very aware of of what an archetype I was playing from a, from a kind of a Jungian perspective, I was this, you know, very well-known Western archetype. Mm. So I was aware sometimes, and this sounds really esoteric and weird, but I was aware. And sometimes, because you know, you've been in in companies when when everything is on and, and moving, it, it moves like one mm. animal, that the whole company. And when those uh, performances were happening, I knew when it came to the crucifixion, it was like it was like a supercharged thing. It was very, very strange. Now, whether you believe in in you know the story of Jesus or you believe in he even existed or not, the fact that it's been replayed so many times across mm -hmm. the last two thousand years, it's going to have some sort of resonance mm -hmm. in some sort of reality. And I was aware on many occasions that that something was going on. It sounds so weird, but you know, I had a few experiences that could only be described as paranormal doing it. Very, very strange. Mm. But yeah, uh, yeah so yeah, the I whole experience was a ma massive learning experience, Russell, really. Yeah, yeah. It is, it's whenever I've seen uh, subsequent productions, but the, the Lyceum one is the is the most powerful because, I, like I said, they didn't hold back visually about what was going on and because of the journey towards it in the show anyway, yeah. but also because of watching this moving oil painting that was going on, you know, you would see the recreation of The Last Supper, that type of feel to it. And then when that scene, you know, arrived, you everybody knew what was going on. You know, your heart is yeah. in because you know the ending anyway. And just because of, you, like you say, there's something that just... It, it's almost baked into our Western psyche of that image. And Absolutely. just so, dare I say, exquisitely recreated. It was very, very powerful to watch. And it, again, remember, I'm not um, a Christian, but I did come out and I go, that was incredible, but awful. And what they did, et cetera, yeah. et cetera. It got, you know, you whipped into it for sure. So thinking about the actual character of Jesus, the role that you were playing, that's a that's a very very loaded character as you've uh, kind yeah. of set out already. How how do you play somebody like Jesus with everything? You know, never mind the weight of the musical itself, but also the mythology behind the the the, the person, the story, the character. Did you kind of approach it a way, like you said, a stillness you mentioned earlier? Is there a, was there decisions physically? Were there vocal decisions? Was there certain chemistry? How do, how do you approach it? Oof. It was, uh, it was tough, man. And again, not, not coming from an acting background in a room full of incredible actors. 
I had to tread very carefully. Again, Zubin was incredible, helping. During the rehearsal process, we investigated a load of things in the rehearsal room. We talked about a lot of stuff. There were some Christians within the cast that all helped and, and put it into kind of uh, scripture context. And I read a ton of books, everything from, you know, obviously the Bible to books on Jesus books that said Jesus didn't exist. You know, I, I tried to look at all, all sorts of different angles, watched everything I could. Seferelli's um, uh, film uh, series about Jesus. Mm. We watched everything. The Last Temptation of Christ had been out by then. So I remember watching that. So everything was informing what I was going to try and do. And you're right, it was it was unbelievably difficult. But what we tried to make it as human as possible. and I was led by Gail, obviously. She helped me immensely, as I said before. Um, and it, it was then about looking at Jesus and Judas as friends, as intellectual sparring partners, to try and, and the love triangle between Judas, Mary and Jesus. We, we really played, I remember talking about that a lot and playing up that, that love and Mm. the real love between the three of them we we, we remember putting that in mm. we took it as from the point that G jesus and judas were pawns in in god's game mm. and he had a he had a bigger plan and and you know take this cup away from me in gethsemane was was kind of our road into that uh part of thinking and and exploration um you know, we, we were, God's got a higher purpose. We're pawns in a game. We just have to play out what mm. Jesus, we played, or I played that Jesus knew what was coming. Uh, and and the turning point in the all right, I'll die mm. uh, part of Gethsemane was that. It was that all the way up until that point, it was like fighting, fighting. It was F you. Literally, mm. we, we played, or Gail and I, with Gail directing me to play it as if I was talking to my father, like, you know, I'm not going to do it, I'm not going to do it. And then there was a moment of realisation. So we, we put that in. And, I, you know, I think we got it. I think there's a, there's a version of Gethsemane on, online from the Ohio Arena in Rotterdam back in 2004 or five or something. Mm. And looking back years later, you know, I was 25 when when I played the part really, which was insane. And, you know, I'm double that age now and life has come and gone. I've lost parents, I've lost loved ones, lost friends. Uh, my kids have been born. There's been a lot of life that's come after, you know, but I, I remember one thing uh, and I never shared this actually. My mother, oof, I can't. Don't worry, don't worry, Sorry. it's cool. It's, um... But that was my way into, because every night I had to keep it real, right? I had to, I had to fight. And yeah. I made the mistake of crying once. Right. And um, and I was like, I'm, and people were like, oh, that was great when you did that. So I felt a pressure then myself. Yeah. But, but of course, I just let, I let, I let it be what it, what it was. And there yeah. was a moment in, in Gethsemane when I, I needed to, and because I, I've had no, um, Tra uh, training and acting I just had to find my own touchstones mm -hmm. to go to to try and get to mm -hmm. the emotional place because some you know you know having been in a long run 30 weeks in you're just thinking about having mm -hmm. what's for tea when you get home that <laughs> night and you know I, I I'm playing the part that I was playing I thought I, I'm gonna cheat myself and cheat everybody who's watching this if I'm not really in this game yeah. so I I I found a couple of touchstones and one was something my mother said yeah that's good yeah it's it's a it's an interesting thing to get through isn't it when you do a long running show you've got to think about yeah. how do i survive this and that was the that was the yeah th those are the tricks isn't it it is when like you say when you do a really really long run you've you've got to pay it out every single time you you perform which is massive yeah. It's, a, it's really fascinating. I want to mention Joanna Ample in this because uh, oh man, she Joanna so Ample played Mary Magdalene, didn't she? And I saw her do Miss Saigon so many times. Oh, I never man. saw um, Leia Salonga do it. I saw Joanna. 
and um, she was incredible. And that love triangle thing that you just cited, it's so fascinating you brought that up because now as somebody who makes original theatre and has done a lot of directing since that time, I go, oh yeah, yes, I got that now. And it's not really necessarily asserted in the show, but no. you know, like a right decision. You're like, yes, it is. There is something there about this kind of like three dynamic thing. Yeah. Actually the core of the show. You know, without being blasphemous at all, there might have been a, or at the risk of sounding blasphemous, there might have been, um, you know, a, a physical love between Judas and Mary. You know, we played that a lot. And then this, mm. how she was getting close to me, maybe he was in love with, you know, we played all of these kind of, not homoerotic things, but we played these kind of, these elements of these dynamics. We were just mm. exploring all of that. And I think it would be, because I, I, as as a, as people, I loved them both very, very deeply, and they were beautiful human beings. And, and I, you know, I must say, Zubin Vala had the best lips of anyone I've ever kissed in my life. <laughs> like they were so beautiful and luscious, and jeez, <laughs> what a what a what a kiss! Apart from Anna Jane Casey, it was the best kiss I've ever had on stage. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you my uh, Zubin Vala story really quickly now while we're talking about Zubin. <laughs> I saw Zubin years later, I think, in um, uh, Roberto Zuko in uh, in Stratford. He was in in that play, and then I, uh, twenty nineteen, there was a theatre here that opened up uh, called the Boulevard Theatre in Soho, and I went to see a new musical, and it was very dark, very ghost like. And I was sat there, I was watching, I was like, I know that voice. Why do I yeah. know that voice? And because it was Zubin, obviously. It was, he was in disguise. I was like, that's Zubin Vala. I know that's him because of his voice, but I can't recognize him because of his costume and stuff. And you know, he's got one of those voices where, you know, if you stand still too long, he's probably going to eat you alive. And yeah. it was so, so <laughs> yeah. brilliant. So brilliant to see him performing in musical theater again. And the fact that I couldn't see it was him, I could hear it was him. That is so great. Um, he's such a beast, man. I tell you, you know, and he's multi-talented, he's an amazing, he's like concert trained pianist as well, his musicality is off the scale, he's just a freak of nature. Mm -hmm. But, um, and he was such a kind of a method, he'd throw himself down the stairs every night, I'm like, Damn, <laughs> you're gonna hurt yourself for this, all right, man, let's just go and have some fun. Oh <laughs> and he needs to get in that place. And then his, his perform everybody, listen, the band was crack. We had the best players in the world in our band, you know. Mm. Brazilian yeah. guitar, we had Ralph on drums and Pete on piano and, you know, Steve Pierce on bass. We had killers. It was a killer's role. It was a killer's role of people in the cast, in the band. Mm. You know, it was one of those, what a lucky, you know, what a lucky thing to do. And yeah, what an introduction into that world, man. It was just crazy. It's like a cultural lightning clap, you know. It's just, just something that happened. I remember feeling it just thinking this is something we knew it was something before it was actually even on the lyceum for some reason it just all everything aligned uh i think culturally for that moment it was it was very interesting and um, so the kind of last question is if you could go around again would you shift anything you know oh, yeah. you think actually i learned this now if I went back and, you know, I mean, it's always a bit of a weird question, isn't it? Because ultimately you achieved a brilliant, brilliant uh, moment in your life. But would would you go, you know what, I would just change even like a note or something or say yes to more note or something. Is there anything you would slightly shift? Oh, that's a brilliant question. And I think, you know, the way the way that it was directed and the way I was directed by Gail was to do less, right? So by the end, of, I was doing hardly anything. I was like this kind of ghostly thing floating around the place. Um, just by being, it, oh, that's such a hard question. I mm. probably would. Mm. I probably would do some vocal changes differently. You know, by the end of the run, it was less kind of spontaneous vocally because you'd have to, you know, to maintain that level of high intensity singing and screaming, you'd have to, mm. you know, there were tricks that I was doing to maintain it. If it was, I'd probably change a little bit of that and make it a little bit more flexible and a bit more soulful. I think it's changed as well. Singing has changed since then. 
yeah uh, especially in theater there's more um soulful stuff coming through and it's less kind of more rigid from my uh perspective when i go watch stuff mm. um i said oh man i don't know if i would i don't know if i would change anything it was a it was a moment in time and it was a moment captured and so proud to have been part of that and and proud now of being in the conversation when people talk about the jesus is or jesus whatever the you know <laughs> um the collective of of holy persons are, are uh being in that conversation is such is so much fun to watch you know my my daughter she was doing drama a level and she came home and said dad we're learning about you in in college. Oh it was it's such a thrill, man. It's yeah. such a thrill. But uh, I don't think I change anything really. It was what it was. I did my best at the time with what I had at the time, with my knowledge at the time. Now, of course, as I said, life has come and gone, and I've seen stuff. And mm. when I sang it in two thousand and four at the Ahoy, it was already different. It was different in I'd seen life and death then. Mm. So that was that was in my voice. That was in the kind of makeup and the, and and my sound, because we take it all in and we we sing it all out. But um, no, I don't think it would have changed anything. Yeah, it's, it's it's kind of a mean question, really, is it? Because you are different. You're completely different, aren't you? You know, if you if you could look at video footage, you go, oh, I wish I'd moved my right foot instead of my left foot or whatever. But that's you know petty, isn't it? Ultimately, the experience is the experience, and you've gone through it, and you're out the other side, and you're a different performer now. Um, I think the naivety, as I said before, the naivety definitely helped <laughs> the, the innocence and the yeah. kind of the, the stupidity, really, that I had. It was like everything was just like, yeah, all right. Let's, mm. But you, you're up tomorrow. You've got to be up by five o'clock because we're picking you up at six to go on. Yeah, OK. All of that. Just, yeah, let's let's do it. You're performing at yeah. night. Yeah, all right. <laughs> yeah. Well, you was one. Oh, quick, very quick story. They had me at, was it the Sydney Dunn Festival, Andrews Festival he has every year? Okay. So they were, because during the auditions for Superstar, um, they were, Andrew and Jim Steinman was writing Whistle Down the Wind, mm -hmm. or were writing Whistle Down the Wind. And uh, at one of the auditions at Abbey Road Studios, Jim Steinman was there, and I'm, I'm a huge Meatloaf fan, and, and as a songwriter, he, he's one of the best ever to have done it. I absolutely love his stuff. And it was a massive thrill to meet him. Mm. And during my audition with Superstar, Weber was on the piano playing like Les Dawson as if he had boxing gloves on. He was just hammering away at this, this piano in Studio 3 of Abbey Road. I was doing Gethsemane and I almost fainted because it was just such a weird, I was, yeah, I was hitting the high notes and I almost fainted. And then Jim said, oh, Andrew, should we get him to sing so-and-so? So they have me, they were teaching me this song from Whistle Down the Wind, which became, I think, a kiss is a terrible thing to waste. Right. So I ended up then uh, going to and demoing all of the songs for Whistle Down the Wind. They, they wanted me to go and play in Whistle Down the Wind. I, I, I had a deal at Sony Records and turned it down and went and did my own thing at that point. But so I'd gone and, and done Sidman. They said, oh, would you come and, come and do Sidman? And I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. Of course. When do you want me to go? Well, it's, it's Saturday morning. You can take, you'll take, but, um, you know, we'll do it at, uh, you'll be the first on. Kiri Takano was there. It was Stephen Gately, love him, from Boyzone, a couple of other people. And you're going to sing this, whatever the song was. And it was like a, a 10 verse song that Meatloaf sang. I can't even remember what it was. And it was ridiculous. And all the words, I, my wife was teaching me all the words. It was crazy. So I, I said, yeah, I'll do it. I'll do it. I said, although... I'm, I'm going, and they made me come back to do the two shows through the matinee and the, and they said, uh, I said, yeah, no sweat. I said, as long as I get fed, because by that time, an, another point about how to maintain the performance, I had to eat certain things at certain times. Yeah. And over the weeks, yeah. I'd, I wouldn't eat a certain thing because it, you know, during the leper scene, for example, I'd have acid reflux and then, mm. you know, so, so I said, I, I, I'm going to need this, you know, food before yeah no problem so when i got there i went down after the show on friday night and they put me up in some travel lodge it was glamorous and then mm -hmm. i went to sidmonton i went to andrews kind of pile in the country if nobody's ever seen it it's just amazing he's got a 
a church in the garden. It's a work in theatre. It's beautiful. And uh, um, gone in, did it, and I said, right, at, at like twelve o'clock, I'm going to have to be ready with. And they were like, yeah, yeah, we'll have your food ready. Bear in mind, they had chefs there and everyone was staying on and they were going to have this eight-course gorgeous meal with all Andrew's wine cellar. And I was gutted, but I had to go back to work. And do you know what they gave me to, to eat? A ham sandwich, a banana, and a packet of crisps. It's the only time I've ever kind of kicked off. Yeah. When I go back to see it, I was like, good God, man. i got to do and Because I knew I had two marathons to run then before mm. it was crazy yeah that's mad isn't it um bit of a bonus question uh is there have you ever been tempted to, to go back and do some musical theater i have my friend fred johansson from the cast ended up uh, being in uh sunset boulevard and it was the only time in since i've not been doing theater and been doing my own stuff that I thought, oh, do you know what? I quite fancy that. I really quite fancy that. And, I, and I'm never going to say never. I was asked to go a few years ago. I went out and met Ted Neely from the film because it was a production going um, around Europe that Ted was doing, and they, they wanted me to be an alternate to Ted. Mm. And I went to see it. It was fantastic. Ted is like 70-odd and still was hitting the notes. It was incredible. And meeting him was a joy. Uh, and he was so sweet. Um, and I thought about that long and hard, but I was like, ah, you know what? I'm just going to leave that there. So, yes, I have been tempted and maybe I'll be tempted again. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be really great. It's, it's the thing, though, isn't it? If you take on a contract for a musical, it's it's big. It takes over your life, doesn't it? It really is a, a massive commitment. Um, yeah. I, I, I'm talking to some agents in London again at the moment yeah. and we're... We've been having a little flirt and a dance for a while. So maybe, listen, who knows? Yeah. yeah. And being back in the theatre every day and Rich and, and Michelle and Christian are like, yeah, we want to see you do some straight stuff. And I'm like, oh, my God. So I've got the fear again and that imposter syndrome has come, is, is looming large. And I'm going, oh, why not? It's, so I'm trying to invoke my, you know, 25-year-old naivety, yeah. bravado nonsense and go, yeah, why not? It's the, you know. It worked yeah. last time. Let's see what happens. Yeah, why well, not? Just say yes to everything. That's what I do. Well, <laughs> yeah. Cool. Thank you so much, Steve. This has been thanks, really, Russell, man. Uh, for giving us things <laughs> to how everything uh, went from your point of view. It was really exciting. Thank and you. Man. Uh, you came back on. I'll put all the links to all of your music, your website, your socials, uh, the Swans Thank you so much. Here, so everybody can click on and see more. All right. Thank you. Thank you. And well done for doing what you're doing as well, dude. It's fantastic. Cool. It's fantastic to watch. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks, man.